side. This next level here needs to have single stranded chromosomes. So what do we call this next set of cells? Good. Now you've got what you're looking for. They are haploid and they're now single stranded. <coughs> only ready to be fertilized or fertilize an egg because it's now reached the point of being haploid. It is single stranded. And these four cells here all came from this one single spermatogonium. This process takes six, seven weeks. You know, you're talking a, a pretty long time here to get to this point. Um, and we are still not done yet because we have to go through yet another process. I'm getting kind of low on the board there, so I thought I'd move this over. What you've seen so far is the process of spermatogenesis. This last little portion, spermiogenesis, is a special time period that takes that spermatid and develops it into a sperm. At this point, you've done all the divisions, right? You've done mitosis, you've done meiosis one, you've done meiosis two. But at this point, what you need to do is make this cell look like a sperm. So every single one of those spermatids goes to the salon and has a do-over, has a makeover. What we're going to do is trim away the excess cytoplasm and we're going to convert <coughs> the nucleus into a head. Well, because it's raining where this sperm is going, this sperm needs to wear a helmet. So we're going to put a helmet on the sperm. And that helmet is called an acrosome. It's actually full of enzymes, and these sperm are going to run head first, kill themselves against the wall of the egg. You might recall hearing in lab about the zona pellucida. That layer around the outside of the egg is tough to break down. So lots of these sperm literally have a suicide mission to break and rupture this acrosome against that zona pellucida because one of those sperm is actually going to make its way through that zona pellucida and fertilize the egg. Sperm can live for about two to three days, so they've got to pack something for their trip to keep them alive. This area right here below the head is the midpiece. The midpiece is powered by mitochondria, so that area is rich with mitochondria. <coughs> gel needs to grow to propel this sperm. So last, what we do is we finish up the process of spermiogenesis by making a tail. Now you completed making a sperm. This entire process takes about 64 to 72 days. We're looking at a 10 total week cycle. And by the time you finish spermiogenesis, you've come from the testes into the epididymis because the epididymis is where the spermiogenesis process occurs. Spermiogenesis itself takes about 20 days because the sperm travel about a foot a day in the 20-foot tubing of the epididymis. So by the time this entire 10-week process from spermatogonium all the way to making a sperm is complete, these sperm are ready for ejaculation. <coughs> so you just said spermiogenesis occurs in the epididymis? Epididymis, yeah. Because all we had learned previously was that that's where they were stored. They are stored there too. So they're, they're inching their way through the epididymis and then they're stored there until they're ejaculated. All right.
The entire thing on the board here is approximately 10 weeks, about 64 to 72 days. The last 20 days, of course, are spent in the epididymis making the sperm a kid into a sperm. Once those sperm are ejaculated, they can live two to three days outside of their environment. That's why if a woman has not yet ovulated, sperm can live for two to three days on her reproductive tract. Or if she has ovulated, they can still continue to live for a two to three day period after that point. So there's actually a rather wide window during the time that we have intercourse and actually receive viable sperm that can fertilize her egg. So she doesn't have to have sex that one day that she's ovulating. There's a much larger window there that sperm can actually survive. The seminal fluid, you know, seminal vesicles, prostate, um, those types of glands release sugary fluids that help to let these sperm live. Because we know that mitochondria need glucose to live, so they actually take a lunch bag with them in terms of the seminal fluid. Hmm. Is that all the anatomy for the sperm you would know? Yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. I wanted to mention to you the process of a vasectomy because that doesn't do anything to this picture on the board. All a vasectomy does is cut the vas deferens. What does that prevent from happening? All it stops is the sperm traveling to the outside of the body. So the blood flow is still there. The testosterone levels are still normal. Sperm production is actually still normal. The sperm just don't get to leave the testes or one of the epididymis because from the epididymis, we know that that co uh, coiled tube turns into the vas deferens. <coughs> so it's a cut in the vas deferens that prevents the passage of these sperm to the outside of the body. Brittany. What happens to them? The lymphatic system picks them up and carries them away. So that way the, the testes don't swell with hundreds and thousands and millions of onion sperm. And it also said something about macrophages. Macrophages, yeah, eat them and destroy them. Yeah. So the 64 to 72 days is just for the um, spermatogenesis, it's or the entire process? The whole process, Okay. Yeah. Start and then the spermatogenesis was the six to seven weeks. Is that what you said? Yeah, this whole process is 10 weeks, and this last part here is 20 days of those 64 to 72 days. Does that make sense? So this is day one. By day 40 something, you are here. By day 64, you could possibly be ready to let them win. So the second means essentially prevent the passage of semen, or not semen, just sperm to the outside of the body. The seminal fluids can still be ejaculated. There's also a hormone that controls sperm production. So there's a hormone called inhibin. Hey, that makes sense, right? that actually lowers sperm production if it becomes too high. Oh, for guys to take testosterone injection. Testosterone injection mimics what the interstitial cells of the testes are doing, which is making testosterone. Because the body monitors testosterone level, if the body realizes, hey, there's too much testosterone here, what does the body tell the testes to do the testosterone production? Well. Stop. So when a guy takes you know, steroid injections or testosterone injections, the body stops making its own t um, testosterone. And of course, testosterone helps out with sex drive, with male secondary sex characteristics, and of course, with sperm production. So if you're talking about excess testosterone, excess sperm production, the body says, whoa, too many here. Inhibin slows down or inhibits sperm production. Testosterone, you might recall, actually does not just get produced by the testes on their own. There is a communication with the anterior pituitary. <coughs> FSH and LH, we typically talk about as female hormones, but those also help to not only produce testosterone, but mature the sperm. Um, FSH and LH come from the anterior pituitary. They also are directed into production by the uh, gonadotropic releasing hormone. Boy, this is going way back. Where does GNRH come from? Good for you, hypothalamus. So ultimately, hypothalamus releases GNRH. 
anterior pituitary releases, FSH and LH. And in males, <coughs> those hormones help to not only produce sperm, but help to mature <coughs> sperm in the testes. So GnRH, FSH and LH, and then testosterone made as a result. So where does inulin fit in? It, it's just a, a monitoring. I don't know who produces it. What, I'm not sure the type of balance is for two but it's in, in response to the high sperm production. So apparently there's some way to monitor that. No, I'm, a, I'm a inulin. Oh, inulin? Yeah. That's a plant polysaccharide. That's something completely different. Okay. Yeah. So it's GnRH to FSH and LH to testosterone. Exactly. The comfort level you want to have for the test on Thursday is, okay, which of these cells are haploid, which are diploid, which of these cells are made by meiosis 1, by meiosis 2, what does the process of spermiogenesis create? Okay, so you're going to want to look at pinpointing different regions of this process. There should be a worksheet in your course pack that helps you to kind of play around with the stuff here. Um, I do have some information for you on page 146. And a little bit more on, let's see. <coughs> a few more questions on embryology on 